Thank you, Sandy. And um, thank you, Lord Mayor, for the invitation to be here today. I'm representing the Lord Mayor of Sydney, Clover Moore. She was unable to attend. And I'd just like to comment that the um, enthusiasm from both the Lord Mayor and the Minister is really fantastic to hear that at the early stages of these projects because there's no way these projects can even come into fruition unless there is that incredible collaboration between different levels of government. Um, I'd also just like to comment that as a Melbourne girl married to an Adelaide boy, to hear the word tram is fantastic. We call them light rail in Sydney and tram's so much more endearing. So just revealed a little bit about my Adelaide link too. Um, what I'm going to do for the next 15 minutes is um, talk to you about five things. Firstly, I'm just going to show a very quick video of the Sydney Light Rail project that just gives you all the statistics and the scope. Um, the video is by Transport for New South Wales, state government, who are delivering the project. And as Sandy said, the City of Sydney are investor in that project. I'm then, oh, sorry, my clicker. I'm then going to talk to you about how we made the case for light rail how we shaped the vision, the issues of constant communication, and some lessons that we've learned. So if we can just go to the video, thank you. The New South Wales Government is expanding Sydney's light rail network with a project that will transform the city's public transport and revitalise the central business district. This new 12-kilometre light rail will provide a fast, reliable public transport service from Circular Quay through the CBD to Kingsford and Randwick via Surrey Hills, Moore Park and Kensington. From Wynyard Station to Town Hall, a one-kilometre pedestrian zone will be created. Light rail will operate safely through new pedestrianised space that will connect some of the city's busiest cultural, shopping and commercial precincts. New paving, street trees, lighting and furniture will create a welcoming environment for workers, shoppers and tourists. There are 19 stops along the route. A fleet of modern electric powered light rail vehicles with air conditioning and accessible low floor design will provide customers with a highly reliable turn up and go service. Light Rail will be integrated with Opal, Sydney's new electronic ticketing system, allowing customers to easily move between different types of public transport. From Central, the route will travel towards the southeast through Surrey Hills with a stop at Ward Park. Crossing the Eastern Distributor via a new bridge, the route will operate in a tunnel under Moore Park West before re-emerging on the sporting precinct side of Anzac Parade. Additional special event services between Central Station and the Moore Park and Royal Randwick Racecourse stops will be provided during major events. This highly sustainable, high capacity transport system will play a vital role in an integrated transport network, will transform Sydney, address traffic congestion, revitalise the urban environment and provide customers with additional transport options to meet existing and future demand. For more information on Sydney Light Rail, please visit sydneylightrail.com. So, as outlined in the video, the Sydney Light Rail project is designed to cater for a growing population of Sydney over the next 20 years, where we will see trips into the city generate up to 1.6 million a day. So, how did we get there? So, in 2006, shortly after Lord Mayor Clovermore was elected, her team began crafting a strategic vision for the city. And I guess with an eye to the harbour, the maverick city, Sydney, started to look deep into its soul that perhaps we weren't as beautiful as our harbour portrayed to the world and that the centre of our city was not what it should be to attract the kind of global competitive city we needed to be. So to commence this sort of regeneration and revisioning process, we started a number of exercises. The first thing we did was we conducted what we call a health check on Sydney, which I believe you've done here in Adelaide already, where we engage some experts who look at um, city making, a Danish architectural firm called Gell Architects, to do this health check. It's called a public space and public life study. And it effectively measures the quality of life and the condition of your city centre. We knew that there were issues with the pedestrian amenity in our city, and with 75 people 75% of people arriving to the city every day by public transport, effectively, at one point, we are all pedestrians in the city. So we started to really understand what was not working in our city centre. And this headline in the Sydney Morning Herald, Take Back the City, really grabbed the attention of people that we could grab back our city, we could improve our city. So the whole journey commenced. The girl study 
recommended implementing a 21st century transport system, which was proposed at that time as light rail. The idea of reshaping the heart of our city and creating a new kind of pedestrian hierarchy to the city where George Street, the main spine in the city, the 2.7 kilometre street that connects Circular Quay to Central, is refashioned as the new civic spine of our city, hosting surface transport light rail. Actually, at the time, we did propose it going around to Barangaroo and then back up through Chinatown. Subsequently, that connection did not happen. Um, so this study created a new kind of master plan, if you will, for our city centre with the George Street light rail as core and it catalyzing three major public squares at Circular Quay, a new square at Town Hall and connecting to Central, a major interchange in the city. And an image of the new Town Hall Square, which has not started construction yet. So following this public space and public life study, in 2006, the Lord Mayor, Clover Moore, and her team requested that the council staff and officers start the process to develop a strategic plan for Sydney. We had not had a strategic plan for Sydney since 1972, when George Clark created one, which actually brought us Martin Place. So we spent the next 18 months researching, um, modelling, consulting, and really undertaking a very deep dive into land use planning, transport planning, social planning, cultural planning, a whole range of inputs, and effectively developed an action plan to deal with climate change, housing affordability, traffic congestion, and generally the livability of our city. And this plan is called Sustainable Sydney 2030, and its mission is to make Sydney green, global, and connected. And I won't go into it in great detail now, we don't have time, it's all on our website, but the plan has 10 targets, five big moves, 10 strategic directions, and 10 project ideas, and each one of those, whether it's a target about improving walkability, whether it's the project idea about this George Street spine, where it's, whether it's the big move about reshaping or resuscitating, as we used to say, the heart of our city, um, all of them re recommended light rail as the key catalyst for change. So congestion in the city has really started to cripple the heart of our city. Every day in Sydney, about 6,000 buses enter the city centre, with up until late last year, 1,000 of those in peak hour just on George Street alone. And these images show you what that condition um, creates in a city centre. The cost of congestion in 2015 was estimated to be about 3.5 billion in Sydney, and at 2030, the estimate was up to 8 billion. So the issue was, unless we did something, it would severely impact our productivity and our ability to act competitively as the gateway to um, the nation. With um, population increase in our local government area from about 200,000 now to about 270,000 in 2030, um, we needed to do something to ease congestion. So early on in the council's um, cycle, probably from about 2005, we started a whole range of feasibility studies around light rail. And we knew that the four to six metre footpaths on George Street, which were carrying pedestrians today, had no room to grow. So this kind of need for change was very clear. And the impact of buses on public life in Sydney, for any of you who've experienced it, is very evident. Um, the issue of noise and air quality I think is now really understood now that the buses have been relocated off George Street. In fact, many people say to us, do you actually even need a light rail? It's just so wonderful without the buses. But yes, we do need a light rail. Um, the replacement of buses on George Street with light rail has been immediately understood because of its spatial efficiency, its environmental benefits, and its overall urban regeneration opportunities. So as I said earlier, since 2005, the city had commissioned many, many, many feasibility studies, a little bit on the minister's point of doing your homework. We tested routes, we have done a lot of land use planning, we have done enormous amount of consultation that got us to a point in 2006 
where we delivered this document really as a kind of advocacy document to the state government called Connecting Sydney, where we recommended that the light rail was the answer to our inner city congestion and that it needed to be up George Street. We then went on to craft the overall city transformation plan, which derives from the, the health check by a young girl, our 2030 plan about resuscitating the city centre, and went through a very lengthy process to develop strategies, policies, project plans for an overarching city regeneration plan for Sydney. And these images here just give you a sense of how square metre by square metre, over quite a long period of time, we have been improving the quality of our city centre, whether it's through the underutilised laneways of Sydney, whether it's through the idea of bringing art and identity and culture into the heart of our city, expressing who we are, and note, noting that many of these regeneration plans cannot come to fruition until the light rail is implemented. And that's where public space improvements in our new town hall square really rely on the catalyst that the light rail will bring to deliver these new public space projects and the improved livability that our city will benefit from. And just a few more images. And again, reinforcing that it is really critical that you have the tools at your disposal as local government in a series of these sort of overarching policies that as the private sector starts to come to the table wanting to participate, we needed to make sure we had the right policy frameworks, the right technical codes to get what we call the glue, um, whether it was the city developing, d delivering or the private sector developing. Um, it was very critical to get those tools that give you the connected and the coherent public space and public domain of our city. We've spent a lot of time and money investing in developing a $9 million new wayfinding system to get you around Sydney because of its geography. It's one of those cities that's not straightforward. We've spent a lot of time developing new public domain furniture so that we improve walkability and we improve the quality of our public domain. And we've also spent quite a lot of time and money bringing artists into the centre of this transformation process by running design competitions, public art competitions, and giving artists an opportunity to make iconic spaces in Sydney so that our city doesn't read like every other city in the world, but we tell the stories where they're, they're indigenous um, stories or they're the stories of who we are as Sydney siders to make a great city. So while we were setting the scene for this overarching transformation process, Transport for New South Wales through Minister Gladys Berejiklian were working very hard on the business case and the feasibility. And in um, 2012, the state government announced that the light rail would run down George Street. So while we'd set the scene for an overall transformation process, we had then started to enter into negotiations with the state government about our investment in this project. And the mayor at the time had already announced that we were prepared to contribute $180 million to the public domain layer of this project. Um, subsequently, the minister did ask us to increase our investment in the project, and the council resolved to contribute $220 million to the project for an, an extra over layer of public domain improvements, widened footpaths, and quality improvements on top of the transport project. So it's really important to understand that distinction. So from there, we then developed what we call the concept design for the light rail corridor through the city. And it was very important that with this contribution of $220 million, we could articulate what the outcomes were that the city wanted for its investment. So we needed to define the not negotiables and the character of George Street. So from our very early studies, we knew that what was really critical was that we needed more space for people. So the four to six metre footpaths on George Street would not yield the new footfall and the new opportunity for economic development that we so needed. And so what was decided and what was critical was that we needed, of the 2.7 kilometre length of George Street, we wanted to have a one kilometre pedestrian zone car free. And that was very, very critical to our investment here. This new one kilometre pedestrian zone gives us another 25,000 square metres of public space 
And you can imagine the flow on economic opportunities there for business in the city to engage with that space and to create a new go-to destination in Sydney. This concept design tested principles, it tested elements, and it really set the agenda for how we would engage with the state government and how we would um, ensure that we got a return on our investment. And I think one of, and I'll talk a little bit about this later, but I think that importance of being clear about your vision is incredibly important. And we've learned a lot of lessons, perhaps where we weren't as clear as we could have been. And perhaps in a way, given that light rail in Sydney, although we have one line, it's still a new form of surface transport for the city. Um, we set specifications for paving. Um, we set specifications for creating a new boulevard down George Street that connects to the harbour, a great green link. The current one kilometre area that's been pedestrianised has a meagre number of five trees along it. So you can imagine the opportunity to create the environmental benefits are great in this project. We set specifications for lighting um, and we wanted to make sure that we had basically set the agenda for the look and feel of the street. When it came to the alignment through the Surrey Hills area, the decision by the state government of how the light rail would move through Surrey Hills as it traversed to Moore Park, the sports precinct, and then onto the health precinct in Randwick, and then onto the university precinct in Kingsford. This route was defined rather late in the um, process. And so from the city's point of view, we were unable to do the lengthy detailed design work that we did in George Street in Surrey Hills. And so we um, have had to work very hard together with the state government and all track the uh, PPP um, operator to get that fine balance between the engineering issues and the urban design city building issues. And I'll talk a little bit about that later. But that is very key, particularly as you're traversing through a very na narrow, vibrant neighbourhood street, as opposed to, I think, in Adelaide, you're very blessed with wider streets than we have in Sydney. Um, the following images just give you a little bit of a flavour for the kind of work we did, as the minister was talking about, of getting the community on board. When the route was announced through Surrey Hills, a lot of residents were taken a little bit by surprise. Um, and we did a lot of work to support the minister to demonstrate to the community that light rail can go through vibrant, dense urban villages. If well designed, it can integrate very beautifully and have a lot of benefits. So we did a lot of quick work to try and demonstrate this. And we looked at a lot of examples and precedents um, of how that has worked effectively and successfully in other cities around the world. And one of the other um, fantastic things that's coming from the light rail moving through the Surrey Hills neighbourhood is um, a number of streets are being terminated so that there is less conflict with the light rail and they're being turned into pocket parks. And there was a rather large residential apartment building in the route of the light rail before it moved into Moore Park. And that building has been acquired by the state government, demolished, and has now been, will be returned to the public as a public park being designed by the city. Um, and many of these public space components of the light rail project are being dedicated back to the city afterwards for us to maintain and um, for the purpose of public benefit and public enjoyment. So again, our investment is um, equated to a number of assets that the city will gain. So at the end of all of this process of de definition and making the case, we then entered into an agreement, um, a development agreement with the New South Wales State Government um, on the light rail and our contribution. And it was very important um, that we'd done this homework so that we could articulate, as I said earlier, the deliverables, the specifications, and something that we call the fundamental obligations, the things that had to happen, and if they didn't happen, our funding wouldn't come forward. And I think that cooperation between the state and local government has been really essential and we've had a very excellent working relationship with the state. Um, on selling the case, I think we have also done a lot of work, which we're happy to share with the City of Adelaide, on the um, economic benefits. And we looked at a lot of cities around the world where they're pedestrianised streets and what that meant in terms of economic return. Many of us would be aware of Broadway in New York when it was pedestrianised, 
that extra footfall on what that did to um, retail rents. And only last weekend in the Australian, um, it was commented that retail rents in George Street have already escalated from about $3,000 a square metre to $5,000 a square metre even prior to the construction of the light rail. So you can see the impact that this investment is already having on the property sector. Um, we also did a little bit of work trying to get the property industry to think 15, 20 years ahead. So as the cycle was changing and as investment was happening, we wanted to make sure that the buildings that were being upgraded along George Street engaged with the new light rail opportunity. What we didn't want is a street that was dead at night. We wanted to have the activation. So we did a lot of work, we called it George Street 2020, to look at how buildings could engage, that's small tenancies, that's food and beverage, that ensure a lively and engaging city 24 seven, or at least into the night. Um, we also stressed the importance of a central alignment on George Street to get the equitable opportunity for economic development on both sides of the street. And the idea was to transform George Street from this to this. What we've seen in the last um, 18 months has been enormous growth in our processing of development applications. Last year alone, 2015, we processed a record development applications to the tune of $7.4 billion, unheralded in Sydney. And just a couple of examples, I won't go through these, are some of the new buildings that are being developed in the city on the back of this investment in public transport. Um, my final theme here is this constant communication. And we can't underpin enough through the work we did on developing the Strategic Vision 2030, the thousands of public meetings, stakeholder meetings, city talks that we invested in to bring the public along and engage them in this plan. Um, the exhibitions that we held showing the benefits of light rail and involving people in the plan the work that we're doing today to communicate and the great work that the state government are doing under um, Minister Andrew Constance, where he has said we will constantly over-communicate. And I think the work that we've done, or the state's done, on the relocation of the buses, which everyone was very nervous about, happened quite seamlessly. The amount of human resource that the government are putting into managing the impacts of construction through business activation programs, um, has been enormous. So I'm just about to wrap up with four lessons for Adelaide. So the first lesson is the importance of addressing this and understanding from the outset that this is not only a transport project, but it's a city building project. And that you need all layers of government to really believe in this. And that you need to ensure that you have the highly skilled staff that can synthesise the engineering and safety aspects of a light rail, which are enormous, um, with the city building agenda. And I suspect that Minneapolis maybe didn't quite understand that. Um, the second point is about this importance of the robust vision, that the definition and clarity of the vision is really essential to the project. And for a city to invest in a project such as this, to be able to define the deliverables and the outcomes is really essential. And you need to make sure that you have the time in the project to do that up front before you go to the market. Um, the contract. Sorry, I've jumped ahead of myself. So the contract. So the contracting environment, likely perhaps to be a PPP for a complex infrastructure project, is critical in my view that a full reference design is done prior to awarding a contract. And that that reference design is part of the contract. So our lesson in Sydney was that we'd done a lot of work on George Street, but perhaps in some areas we hadn't done as much work. And that, that at the end of the day causes problems for the contractor that usually the community aren't aware of the detail, it often um, brings up other technical issues, and in the end, in my view, it actually can slow the project down. And in some cases, like we might hear about this from the Gold Coast, sometimes slow it down to a grinding halt. So really, really critical, the robust vision makes it into the contract. And lesson number four, um, the underground world. Um, make sure you do everything to understand what's underground. 
um, engaging with the utilities up front um, is really, on a project like this, a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. And we know cities like Barcelona invest a lot of money and time in getting a really fantastic servicing environment. So when you think you've just done your, you've done all the work checking underground utilities and you've done your last pothole, think again. So finally, it is our strong belief in Sydney that with all of this aligning, we can deliver a really fantastic transformation for what growing cities in Australia need. Thank you. Thank you.